Hey y'all! In this video, I'm going to take a few steps back and we're going to get back into importing DXF files. I still get a lot of questions about importing DXF files and specifically about long calculation times, large files, large G code files, long G code files. And this all comes down to the way DXF files are created and what the software has to do to calculate these toolpaths. So let's go ahead and get into a new session of Aspire. And we'll go ahead and we'll import a DXF file. And I'll go ahead and break it down a bit for you. There are a couple of ways of importing a DXF file. The most common one is to go up to File, Import, Vectors. But there's an icon out here in the File Operations section of the Drawing tab that makes it a little bit easier. And that is this one right here next to Save. It's Import Vectors from a file into the current job. We'll go ahead and we'll click that icon and we'll navigate to the folder that I have my DXF in and I'll double click it to go ahead and import it. Now this is a simple monogram of a game tile based on a popular board game that shall remain nameless and these DXF and SVG files are available over on my website, marklindsaycnc.com, and there's a link to these tiles down in the description of this video. Now, if we look at the DXF as imported, everything looks fine. If we select the letter M here and tap N to go into node editing, we can see that this is a simplified set of vectors here. It's all nothing but straight lines, and there are points where you would expect them to be. Everywhere there's a direction change, there's a point. And that's just as you would expect it. The problem comes in not so much with straight lines. It has to do with curves. Let me select this number three, and you'll see what I mean. Look at the number of points in this number three. This all has to do with the DXF file format itself. Now let me tap the letter N to come out of node editing and I'll click off to deselect. And I'm going to take a trip over here into my CAD software, which is a program called NanoCAD. It is available for free and I've put a link to it down in the description box of this video. So if I go into NanoCAD and zoom in on the number three here and I click on it to select, you can see the same thing. The DXF file format is a stripped down format that displays the vectors that were drawn in a CAD program, but they're broken down to their most simple points. Let me right click and unselect here. The native file format for drawings made in AutoCAD, for example, is the DWG file format. The DXF file format was developed by Autodesk, the makers of AutoCAD, as a way of sharing the drawing amongst different versions of the software because like most CAD CAM software versions are backwards compatible but they're not forward compatible so if you have one architect working with the 2012 release of AutoCAD and another architect working with the 2004 release of AutoCAD. The architect using 2012 can open the file that was made in the earlier version 
but the architect using the earlier version cannot open the file made in the later version. So the DXF file format was created as a way for those two, for example, to be able to share the drawings back and forth with one another. Well, the different CAD software manufacturers and publishers jumped onto that DXF file format, and almost all of them have the ability to export a drawing as a DXF file, no matter what their file format is. So the DXF file format strips down the drawing to its most basic elements. And the most basic element of any drawing is going to be a straight line. They don't use a lot of arcs. They don't use a lot of fancy Bezier curves. When it takes a curve like this number three, it will break it down into a series of straight line segments. Now, in this software, you can see these points are signified by the hollow blue square, and the center of the span between the two points is this blue rectangle. So if we back out here, you can see just how many straight line segments were needed and how short the spans are in between them. The software needed to break this down to represent a curve. That works fine for CAD programs because CAD programs don't really care about the number of points needed to represent a curve or to create a vector. But when we get back over into a V-carve or a spire, it does matter because the software is going to look at all of these points when we go to calculate our toolpath and it's going to make individual calculations that's going to move our bit from this point, for example, to this one, then to this one, then to this one when that's just not necessary. So what we'll need to do when importing a DXF file is we'll need to eliminate a lot of these points. And we'll do that by fitting curves to these vectors. And it will eliminate most of these points that are just unnecessary. So let me tap the letter N to come out of note editing. And I'm going to leave this number three selected. And I'm going to come over here under Edit Objects to this icon right here, Curve Fit. And I'm going to go ahead and click on it. When we first go into the Curve Fit window, we'll see a gray representation of each of the points that makes up these vectors. That's showing us what we have now. Let's go over here to the form. And let's take a look at it. We have three different types of fitting we can do to these vectors. We can go with circular arcs, Bezier curves, or straight lines. Well, we already have straight lines, so we don't want to use that. We could use circular arcs because this is mainly a curved vector. But if we take a look in here, we'll notice there's a little bit of jaggedness. It's not exactly one fluid arc that flows around each of these vectors out here that make up our character. So I tend to use Bezier curves. Bezier curves are lines that can be adjusted to make a, to form a radius or smoothed out to get rid of a jagged, lumpy appearance. So you have more control with Bezier curves than you do with a circular arc. An arc uses a known radius, and you really can't control that radius. It does what it does. Bezier curves you can control. So I'm going to convert these straight line segments to Bezier curves. The tolerance. The tolerance 
in this situation is not so much how closely you want to follow the shape, but how closely you want to follow each individual point within this shape. So if you set your tolerance real low, like this is set at one one thousandth of an inch, that's pretty low. The software works with a tolerance of four places to the right of the decimal. But if I go any lower than one one thousandth of an inch, it's going to take any jaggedness that's in these, the placement of these points, and it's going to keep it. So if I go any lower than this, it's more than likely going to keep a lot of these points that it really doesn't need to keep. Feel free to go ahead and adjust your tolerance if you'd like. Personally, I have never adjusted this. I keep the tolerance that was the default that was set when I got the software, and I've been happy with it. If you want to adjust your tolerance and allow the software a little bit more freedom, in some of these uh, vectors, then be my guest. You really can't mess it up. But I prefer to leave it as is. Now, when I preview this, I want the software to keep my sharp corners. I have sharp corners here, here, and here. I want it to keep those with a max angle of 60 degrees, meaning if the angle is more than 60 degrees, it will use a Bezier curve to make that angle. If it's less, it's going to keep a straight line. The most important option in this form is replace selected vectors. I always have a check mark here. If I uncheck this, then complete the form, what I'm going to have is two sets of vectors here. Some will be duplicates, some won't. This can cause a lot of headache when you go to clean things up. With this check mark, it will delete the current vectors and replace them with the vectors we're getting ready to preview. That's what I want it to do. I want the software to automatically get rid of these old vectors that I no longer want to use and replace them with these cleaned up vectors. Now let's go ahead and click preview and see how many of these points this process is going to get rid of. Click preview and that simplified it a lot. Now instead of having to calculate where the bit has to move to connect all of those little points together, we have two here where we probably had 50 to 100. So I now have two choices. I can either cancel this if I decide there are other errors that I need to fix, or I can click OK and accept these simplified vectors. Well, I could also adjust my tolerance a little bit. Maybe I think I can get rid of a few more points. Adjust my tolerance a little bit, click Preview again, and then make my decision. But for me, I think that this is simplified enough, so I would go ahead and accept it. So I'm going to do just that. I'll go over here, click OK, closes the form, and now with my number three still selected, if I tap the letter N to go into note editing, we see the drawing is much, much simpler. It's applied Bezier curves to these vectors where there used to be hundreds of individual line segments. I'm very happy with that. So I'll tap the letter N to come out of node editing. Click off to deselect. Well, that's the first question that I get about DXF files, is why they tend to create such huge G-code files and why there are so many points. The next question I get a lot has to do with layers in the Layer Manager. So let's go up here into the Layer Manager 
and we see we have layer underscore one. Now, for those of you who have been working with the software for a while, you know that's not how Vectric names layers. It doesn't use an underscore. So let's click on the layer manager and we'll see here that we have layer one, which is the default layer that opens when you create a job in job setup. We have layer zero and then we have layer underscore one. And this goes back to the CAD software once again. When the DXF file is exported from the CAD software, it exports two layers, layer underscore one and layer zero. Let's go back over to NanoCAD. Layer zero is used for metadata of the file. You can put in color information, line types, you can put in different text style, you could put in uh, clients' names, you can put in versions. It's basically metadata that is not displayed on the screen within the vectors itself. That data is stored on layer zero. So it's imported with the file so that an architect who imports this drawing has all that information that is attached to the file, but it's not necessary for it to be displayed on the screen with the vectors. So if we come up here into our layer manager in Aspire and we look, we have that layer here. Well, Aspire doesn't care about all of that stuff. It doesn't read the metadata from the file it's being imported. So the majority of the time, layer zero is empty and it has no data. Not always. There are times you will find vectors on layer zero. Well, how do you know if there are any vectors on layer zero? Well, you can tell by looking at this third column right here. If you see here, layer one is in bold because that's the active layer that we're working in right now. And you can see the representation of a circle and square right here in this. It represents a sheet of paper. But there is nothing here and there is nothing here. They're both blank. And if I select layer zero, zero goes bold, but there's still nothing here. That blank page indicates that there is no data, there are no vectors on this layer. It's unnecessary to keep. Again, it's just the metadata for the drawing that the Vectric software does not access. It doesn't care about. There may or may not be anything in this metadata. So basically, we can eliminate this layer to eliminate any confusion. And the easiest way to do that is to come over to this icon right here, which is a context menu icon. If I click on that, it opens this menu here that has tools for use with this layer. And I can just select delete and it gets rid of that layer. Well, now let's do a little bit of cleanup here, a little bit of uh, organization with the layers we are going to keep and with the vectors that we're going to use. Just to simplify things, I want to break this down so that I have my outline on one layer and my text on another. So I've gone ahead and I've selected my text I'm going to put my cursor over one of the vectors, it doesn't matter which, right click, and I'm going to move to layer one. So now when I come up here and I select layer one, we have the representation of the circle and square, the same as we have down here. But now I have two layer ones, I need to rename these to avoid confusing myself. So I've just, I've selected layer one as my active layer. Let me click on it again to rename it and I'll name it text and tap the enter key. 
I want to rename this layer as well, just so I know I have the outline of the tile on this layer. So I'll select it, click it again to select again, and I'll type outline, tap the enter key, and it's done. I now have my text and my outline on separate layers. Everything is nice, neat, and organized. So now let's get into v-carving. I can go ahead and select my text, come over to my toolpath tab, and I'm going to v-carve my text. I'm going to carve to a flat depth of 0.1. This is my default. I generally speaking v-carve to a depth of 0.1. It's not quite an eighth of an inch. I get good relief out here without going crazy. Uh, my go-to bit is a 90 degree V bit. I am going to use a clearance tool. I'm going to use an eighth inch end mill. And that's just so the bit will get up here closer into the corners. That leaves less for the V bit to have to come into these corners and clean up. I'm going to use a raster strategy. I want the bit to go back and forth. I don't want it to make circles out here. And I'm using a raster angle of 90 degrees, meaning the bit's going to go vertically back and forth. And I chose that because the majority of these vectors are vertical. If the majority of the vectors ran side to side, I would change that to zero. But because most of these vectors run vertically the long way, I'm going to leave that at 90 degrees. I'm not going to make any other changes to this, and we'll just call this vcarve text. We'll calculate the toolpath. Another thing I get asked about a lot is the number of clearance tools you can use with a vcarve toolpath. Now, let me go back into the toolpath for a second here. I have my V-bit selected. I've checked Use Clearance Tools. And I used Select to add this 8-inch end mill. If I decide I want to use another end mill out here, if I want to use a quarter inch to speed up the cutting out here in these large areas, I can use click Select again choose a quarter inch end mill and it added that end mill to my list. So when I calculate the toolpath, I now have three separate toolpaths out here. It's going to use the quarter inch end mill to clear away most of this inside. Then it'll use the eighth inch end mill to come in and get up here tighter into the corners. Then it'll use the V-bit to do my outline of the vector and do any final cleanup in these corners to give it a nice square corner. Now, personally, I don't think this is all that necessary. So I can get rid of that quarter inch end mill because I, I just don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's large enough for me to need that. So I'll double click it again. Come back and select that quarter inch end mill and remove it. Now, if you'll notice, when I added that quarter inch end mill, it reset my strategy here to offset. I now need to go back over to raster, get my raster angle here, and now I can calculate and it removed that extra toolpath. So when you're using a V carved toolpath, you can use as many clearance bits as you want, and it will create separate toolpaths for each bit. So let's go ahead and we'll change the color of these toolpaths just so you can see it. I have vCarve text selected. I'll come up here and set my toolpath color to black so that there's a good contrast. I'll do the same over here. And I have check marks in both. Let's preview both visible toolpaths. And there is our monogram. 
Now we'll close the preview window, come over to the 2D view, and I'm going to show you two different ways of handling this outline. The first one I'm going to show you is a, I'm going to put a beveled edge on this tile and then cut it out, leaving that beveled edge visible. So I've got my vector selected and I'll come up here and I'll do a profile toolpath. I'm going to set my cut depth to 0.1, the same as my V carving flat depth. And I'm going to select my 90 degree V bit. And I'm going to machine on the vector. The point of the bit is going to be right on top of this vector, not to the inside or the outside. Then I'm going to just call this outline. And we'll calculate it. I'm going to change the color of this one to black as well so that you can see it. Then I'll preview that toolpath. Okay, that looks pretty nice. So let's go back over to the 2D view. I'll close my preview. And now I want to use this same vector for my profile cutout. So I'll come up here to the profile toolpath. And I want to cut all the way through the material. I want to cut a little bit further than the thickness of the material, just so that I'm certain it's going to cut through and down into my spoil board just a little bit. So I'll tap the letter Z, which takes the material thickness from my job setup. Then I'm going to type in plus 0 0.005. It will add five thousandths of an inch to the thickness of my material. And I'll tap equals. And that gives me my cut depth. Since I'm doing the profile cutout, I'll want to cut this out with a quarter inch end mill. I'll select that. And I want to make sure that I cut outside the vectors. If I were to go outside and cut this, I would do a separate last pass with a allowance of point zero 0.01. I would add tabs for this demonstration. I'm not going to. I do want to check to make sure I have sharp external corners selected over here. And we'll call this cutout. Calculate. I'm getting the warning it's going to cut through the material. That's fine. And we'll preview that toolpath. Now I'll double click to delete the waste. And there is our finished project. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the toolpath color to no fill so that you can see the chamfer I've got here. And that chamfer is again. 0.1 of an inch, the same as the chamfer right here in my V carving. It's the same depth. I could make it bigger. I could make it a quarter of an inch. That would be a more dramatic chamfer on this project, but I'm going to leave it at 0.1 so that it matches the chamfer here in my letters. Go ahead and go back to a toolpath color of black because that is how I would finish this project. I would paint the edge and that chamfer black as well as the text. Flip it over, put a keyhole up on top, and it's ready to hang. There is another option with this set of vectors right here, and that is to go back and we'll preview these three here and that is to leave the material alone, leave it sized just our material size with this outline here and that is an option and if you don't mind the rounded corner here 
because of the radius of the V-bit, you could carve this as is. But what if you wanted a square outside corner here? You didn't want that rounded radius left by the V-bit. Well, you could then go ahead and create a V-carve toolpath. Well, the problem with that is you can't V-carve with a single vector. You have to have two vectors out here. Well, that's simple enough to modify. We'll close our preview window, go back over to the drawing tab, and now I want to complicate matters a little further by adding another layer. So we'll right click this vector and we'll copy to layer, new layer. And we'll call this layer vcarve outline. I'll make the new layer visible. I'll make the new layer active. And we'll click OK. So now I have two vectors here for our outline. Let's go ahead and we'll turn off the text for a minute and we'll turn off the outline, just leaving the vcarve outline layer active. I'll click off to close my layer manager, select my vector again, and I want to offset this vector inwards. So we'll come down here to offset. I want to offset inwards. I think one eighth of an inch would be too narrow. I think a quarter of an inch would be too wide. So let's split the difference and go with 3 sixteenths. Now, I don't know the decimal equivalent of 3 sixteenths right off the top of my head. So I'll go 3 slash 1 6, then tap the equals button and let the software do the math for me. It doesn't matter if I select new or not. I don't want to delete the original. I do want to create sharp offset corners. We'll go ahead and we'll offset. Close that. Now I'll select both vectors. Go back over into the toolpaths tab and do a V-carve toolpath. I'll use the same settings that I used the last time for the text. I don't think I'll need a clearance tool. I think an eighth of an inch is too wide to clear any of this out. So I'll uncheck the clearance tools. I'll calculate the toolpath. And I'll take that toolpath, turn it black as well. And let's go ahead and do the vcarve clearance, vcarve text. I'm not going to do the outline or the cutout. We'll preview those visible toolpaths. That gives me a nice outline around the monogram with nice square corners all the way around it. And either or will work. You could use the outline if you preferred, or you could use the v-carve if you preferred. But you've got two options using the exact same vectors to do with a simple monogram. And it all comes down to using the layers to your advantage, selecting which active layer you're going to machine at the time, and keeping everything organized. So you have two options in the same file. Now when it comes to making more complex patterns with DXF files, the same rules follow. There are just more steps involved. For instance, if I were going to make a big wall plaque, something like this, all it takes is a bit of scaling, a bit of copying, and importing more of the same file. Now I'll go ahead and show you how I did this, but most of this is going to be time-lapsed just because a lot of it is going to be importing and copying the same vectors over and over. So let's get rid of this and I will go ahead and just start a new file. I don't want to save that. I already have it saved. And this is going to have to be a fairly large piece of material to make this file. So I'm going to go for a width of 48 inches, a height of 36 inches, 
and I can see carving this into a piece of half inch plywood. So I'll use 0.5 as my material thickness. Nothing else is going to change. My resolution is at standard because there is no 3D component to this at all. I'll click OK. Now I'll start importing my DXF files. And that's a simple matter of import vectors and just start with the first letter I want to import. I want to scale this down so that I can fit everything on this sheet of material. So with it selected and again the vectors import selected, I'll come over here to set selected object size, make sure I have link XY checked and I'm going to scale it down to a six inch square. Click apply. Then before I close this, I'll go ahead and move it over just straight horizontal away from the center so that I can import the next one. Then I'll close and now is when I'll go into a time lapse because a lot of this is going to just be repetition of the same thing I just did. Now when I get this letter placed over here close, I'm going to zoom in, grab this corner, click and drag it over and snap it to this corner of this tile. Then I can click off, close, and I have this tile butted up even with this tile here. Now I'm going to go through and do the same thing on the next vectors I import. Okay, with my last name in place, now I want to add my wife's name over here and my name over here. Well, I already have a lot of the letters I need to do this. So there's no sense in importing them again. So what I'll do is I'll do a box select for my letter L. Click it again to go into move and transform mode. Then hold down the control key telling the software I want to make a copy. Come over to the center box, click and drag a copy right up here. Then zoom in, bring it down. Then I'm going to do that with the N, the D, and the A. Okay, with those copied, I can box select everything, then tap F9 to center it up on my material. Now I can continue importing to get my name over here. Okay, with all of my vectors imported, now I can go about applying curves to all of the letters involved. So I'll hold down the control key and tap the letter A to select all. And I'll go into node editing and I can see that all of my straight line vectors are just fine. I don't need to worry about them. What I need to worry about is the D the 2, the S, the 3, the R, and the 5. So every vector with curves in it is what I'm going to work with. I'm not going to work with any of the straight line vectors. They're just fine. So let me tap N again to come out of node editing. And I'll center up my drawing. And I'm going to come down here and box select D2, hold down shift, select D2, select the S, select the 3, select the 5, select the R. Now I can release shift. So these are the vectors that I'm going to check. Come over here to curve fit. I'm going to select Bezier curves 
I'm not going to touch anything else. I'm going to make sure Replace Selected Vectors is selected. I'll preview it. There are still quite a few vectors in my letter S, but that's okay. It's not as much as it was. It has simplified it quite a bit. The number 3 looks okay. The R is fine. The 5 is okay. The 2 and the D, they're OK. I'm going to go ahead and accept that. So, we'll click OK. Now I want to box select all of my text. So, hold down Shift. And I'm going to group these vectors. Right click, Group Objects. I want to use these squares as an outline. I want to carve a chamfer on each one of these squares. But then what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to come up with a vector that represents the outline of the entire sign so I can cut it out. So I'm going to introduce another layer. First let me Hold down Control, tap the letter A to select it all. Hold down Shift and click on any of my text to deselect that text. Now I want to put my cursor over one of these vectors. Right click, Copy to Layer, New Layer. In the new layer I'm going to name Profile outline and I'll click OK. Now what that's done is up here in my layer manager and I do need to go back in and rename and clean up. That's created a layer with the outline vector on it. I've made that active and let's turn off all of the other layers. So now I have this outline on this layer. I'll need to go in and I'll need to trim away all of these inside vectors so that all I have remaining is the outside profile of all my tiles. That's easy enough to do. We can go in here with our trim tool. Make sure I have rejoin trim sections automatically checked. Then I'll come in here and start trimming. The thing to remember is we have two vectors here, one on top of the other. We have the vector for this square and the vector for this square. And the same holds true all the way through the pattern. So I'll have to click twice. Click once to cut one vector away, click twice to trim the other. And I'll go around and I'll do this all the way through this entire project. Okay, with that trimmed away, I can close this. Now just to make sure I don't have any vector fragments left in here, let me select it and make sure I have one solid outline. Just to double check, I'll go over here to join open vectors, click that icon and I see that I have one closed vector. So I can close this. And now this is the outline I'm going to use for my profile cutout. Well, now it's time for a little bit of house cleaning and organization again. So let's turn on all of my layers. Again, I can delete layer zero. So I'll do that. And now I want to put my objects in the proper layer. So click off. I'll select my text, right click, move to layer 1. That puts all my text on layer 1. Now I want to rename that text. Now I'm going to make layer 1 my active layer. I'm going to shut off my text layer and my profile outline. And I want to name this Tile Outlines. 
click off and I'm going to select all of these vectors and group them as well. Now I'll turn everything back on and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to start calculating toolpaths. So we'll go over to the toolpath tab and I'm going to select my text first. We'll do a V-carve toolpath. Nothing has changed. I want to do a flat depth of 0.1. I'm going to use my 90 degree V-bit. For a clearance tool, I'm going to use an 8th inch end mill. Again, I'm going to raster strategy on this. The raster angle of 90 degrees. Because again, most of the long lines are vertical. And we'll call this V-carve text. And we'll calculate. Again, I'll change the toolpath colors to black so that you can see them. And we'll preview these two visible toolpaths. Close my preview window. Go over to the 2D view. Click off to deselect. And now I want to turn off my profile outline layer so I don't have any confusion. Then I'm going to select my tile outlines. And again, I'm going to do a profile toolpath. Again, I want to change that to 0.1 so that it's carving to the same flat depth as my text. And for an end mill, I'm going to use 90 degree V-bit and machine on the vector. I will name this V-carve outline and we'll calculate the toolpath. Again, change the color to black so you can see it and we'll preview that toolpath. Now we have one remaining toolpath to calculate. Come over to the 2D view. I'll switch my layer to the profile outline. Turn it on. Turn off the tile outlines to eliminate any confusion. I'll select that vector and I'll do my profile cutout toolpath. I'll want to go the thickness of my material plus 0 0.005 equals. For the tool, I'm going to use a 8th inch end mill to get as tight into these inside corners as I can. It's not going to be perfect. I'll still probably have to file to get a sharp 90 degree corner but I can get close with an 8th inch end mill. I want to machine to the outside of the vectors. If I were doing this outside, I would do a separate last pass. 0 0.01 inch allowance. I would add tabs. Let me edit them. And I would put them out here on my edges for sure to hold these down and I would probably put one here, here, here and here just to be safe to make sure that this didn't bounce or shake or vibrate when it went to cut these out because these are some pretty long expanses here. Okay now after doing all of that, for this demonstration, I'm not going to add tabs because I want to be able to delete this waste material out here to show you the finished project. I would make sure I have sharp external corners checked. Decide whether I'm going to do any ramps or leads. And I will call this cutout and calculate that toolpath. I get the warning it's going to cut through the material. And now let's preview. Double click to eliminate the waste. And there is our finished project. 
we have change this back to no fill. We have a nice chamfer all the way around all of our tiles. In between the two tiles and to the outside. Everything looks nice. I could either flip it over to the back here. I could either put a keyhole up here and a keyhole up here or just go with one long horizontal keyhole here for hanging. But all in all, it's a very decent looking project. One that would take a large piece of material, but the vectors are all scalable so that you can make any size that you want. So, the takeaway from this long, boring video is when you are using a DXF file, probably the single most important step to take is fitting curves to these vectors. This is especially true when you're dealing with curves and it doesn't matter if it's text or if it's a pattern that you're trying to use, fit curves to those vectors that will speed up your toolpath calculation time. It will reduce the size of the G-code file that comes out. That is probably the most important part of anything to convey in this video. The next one is to use your layers to your advantage. So, I hope you got something out of this video. Again, these DXF files are available over at my website, marklindsaycnc.com. They are also available as SVG files, which can also be imported into vCarve. Just as a reminder, this afternoon at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, I'll be hosting a live Q&A session where we can discuss anything I've demonstrated in this video. Again, that's today at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern, right here on my YouTube channel. And I've put a link to that live Q&A down in the description box of this video. Now, these live Q&A sessions are a great reason to go ahead and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. And when you click that red subscribe button, click that little bell right next to it. Then you'll get a notification the next time I post a video and the next time I go live. So I hope to see you this afternoon. And as always, whether you subscribe to my channel or not, I'd like to thank you very much for taking the time to watch. And y'all take care.